Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us uh, for today's uh, webcast uh, covering the uh, U.S. economy, uh, capital markets, and, of course, the apartment market. My name is Hassam Naji. I'm Managing Director of Research and Advisory Services for Marcus and Milchap. I have the pleasure of being joined by Bill Hughes, uh, the head of our Capital Markets Division, Marcus and Milchap Capital Corporation. I uh, would also like to welcome John Seabury, who recently joined our management team as the head of our national multi-housing group, who will be joining us on these webcasts in the future. Before we get started this morning, I wanted to point out a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, for those of you that um, are interested in the, uh, the slides that we're going to be presenting this morning, please use the d uh, download slide button to have your own uh, copy of the slides downloaded for you. Uh, if you happen to see your screen or sound freeze at any time during the presentation, please hit the F5 key, which refreshes your connection. And uh, to make this session more interactive and for us to benefit from some of your thoughts, we're going to have an, a series of audience polling questions uh, regarding the various topics that we're covering. I encourage you to participate in those by following the basic instructions, multiple choice uh, questions and answers and that we'll be sharing those results uh, throughout the presentation this morning. Uh, my uh, job to kick this off is to first discuss what's happening with uh, uh, the economy and with the uh, apartment market fundamentals. And for those of you that have been tracking uh, our reports and have joined us in, in prior presentations, uh, you would know that uh, last year, uh, around the August, September timeframe, when there was a lot of concern in the marketplace, related to the downgrade of the U.S. debt, and many forecasters came out with the expectation of a double-dip recession. Uh, having looked at the numbers, having looked at the uh, fundamental vital statistics, we took the position that it was unlikely uh, we would experience another recession. And to the contrary, we thought after a lull, the economy would actually pick back up. Uh, for the most part, that forecast has been accurate going into 2012. On the other hand, we also didn't quite buy into the let's uh, cork the champagne bottle momentum that seemed to be catching the headlines in January and February when some of the job numbers were well above expectation. Uh, we pretty much thought that this is going to remain a pretty volatile and choppy recovery. And as you can see on the screen, uh, the headwinds versus the positive factors in the economy are still creating this tug of war that we still believe is going to last. Um, where we have a number of macro concerns, whether it's our own political paralysis and debt issues, uh, whether it's uh, European uh, debt now leading to a, uh, a very, very low level of growth in Europe, if not a recession, uh, which does affect the U.S. and the global economy, of course, whether it's uh, for sale housing market, uh, which still does not have much traction, and a variety of other headwinds, uh, we believe that uh, this uh, environment is going to last for a while. Uh, and uh, at the same time, while these concerns are serious, we have uh, an election year, and uh, the headwinds that I've uh, just talked about are long-term in nature, given the magnitude of the crisis that we, we just came out of a couple of years ago, uh, we cannot ignore the positive factors of the economy that continue to improve. Uh, and these were some of the vital statistics that I referred to that, that led us to take the position that a double-dip recession was very unlikely uh, toward the end of um, uh, 2011. And that's led by uh, tremendous growth in retail sales, well above expectation, uh, which accounts for 70% of our economic activity. U.S. retail sales are now 10% above the pre-recession 2007 peak. So the consumer has been stronger than expected. Uh, we've had uh, terrific uh, corporate earnings, uh, corporate profits are now 20% above the prior peak, uh, and the productivity growth has grown to a, to a level that really tells us companies have to continue to hire workers. And uh, the job numbers are still somewhat disappointing uh, when you compare it to prior recoveries, but having added 2.1 million private sector jobs over the past 12 months, that's another pretty positive factor. I'll elaborate more on that later. Um, and our first time on employment claims which is an indication of what's happening in the labor market, still point to a continuation of job creation uh, over the next 12 to 18 months. But we're going to have these choppy months. Last month, uh, the numbers came in at a very disappointing level, half of what they were in the prior two or three months. And that really began to raise concerns again about this recovery. 
but I think we're in an environment where this tug of war is going to continue, given these macro level headwinds. But we cannot ignore the evidence, the actual facts of a strengthening U.S. economy. Uh, some of the uh, factors that I think uh, are important to review in this regard uh, are uh, the broadening of the recovery, uh, number one. And as I mentioned before, productivity is at a level where uh, companies actually have to hire, um, and we'll talk more about that in, in a moment. But if you look at the chart on your screen, you'll see that just about every major sector is adding a, a decent level of jobs. Professional business services led the uh, job growth in the past 12 months, followed by education and healthcare, leisure and hospitality, trade, transportation, and manufacturing. Even manufacturing is adding jobs. And one of the uh, points on the prior graph was the U.S. export indicator, which is growing at 7 or 8%. It accounts for 13% of our total economic output when for sale housing accounts for uh, just over 2% of our economic output. Yet the headlines and the negative uh, themes that we hear through the media are dominated by uh, housing versus a bright spot in the economy, which is uh, our exports. And that, of course, is, is translating to some manufacturing jobs, uh, which, uh, which are uh, very interesting to monitor at a time when U.S. manufacturing has been on the decline. Another important indicator is what's happening uh, with the nature of jobs that are being created and the patterns of job creation. If you look on the left of your slide here, you'll see that uh, in 2010, we were relying on temporary employment to the tune of over 30% of all net new jobs being created. That's now down to less than 10%. Uh, so companies have, have arrived at a point where there is enough confidence and enough need to hire more permanent workers. Now, wage growth isn't there yet, which actually is a concern to the apartment market, especially the Class A sector, and we'll address that later in the presentation. Uh, but on the right of this graph, you see this monthly pattern of some positive momentum, which seemed to have lost uh, some steam uh, last month. Again, not too surprising um, that it was that volatile, and we're gonna, I think we're going to see uh, this pattern continue into 2012. But our expectation is that the 2.1 million uh, private sector jobs that were created in the last 12 months may be a little bit better for the, for the next 12 months. And you also, if you noted on the prior slide, the loss of jo government jobs is beginning to wane. So that's less of a drag on the economy. At this point, uh, I'd like to go to our first audience question, and that is uh, to test your expectations regarding job growth in the next 12 months. Uh, and uh, really 12 to 18 months, do you expect job growth to be weaker, the same, stronger, or much stronger than it's been over the past 12 months. Uh, let's see what uh, uh, you all have to uh, say about that. In a few moments, we'll uh, share the results of, of the poll. Now, as it comes to the apartment market, job creation, of course, is very, very important. Something between 40 to 50% of all new jobs that are being created are going to young adults between the age of 18 to 34. Uh, that's a in very important indicator. Another important indicator and, and something that the apartment market has really benefited from is the release of pent-up demand. This graph shows you there are 3 million plus additional young adults living at home since 2007. Uh, and this pent-up demand that's being created for future renter household formation is an important uh, factor to keep monitoring. This is, of course, partly due to the recession as people moved in with family. It also has to do with demographics. Of course, we're coming into a very strong demographic wave of 18 to 34-year-olds. Many of them haven't moved out yet uh, to form their own renter households. But in addition to job creation and the percentage of jobs that's going to young adults, this demographic and um, uh, pent-up demand indicator is an important one to monitor and certainly has been one of the reasons why apartment absorption has been so strong. Another one, of course, is the... A uh, trend on for sale housing with the home ownership, uh, ownership rate falling and having been on, on the decline for the past uh, two to three years uh, and the psychological preference uh, to rent as, as, uh, as well as the lifestyle preference to rent for many of the different types of uh, renters that we have throughout the marketplace. Um, the um, negative uh, trends on the for sale housing have been, uh, of course, translating to positive demand for rental units. Uh, we are at a place where, ironically, we're hearing more and more from our large national uh, clients that they are seeing some loss of renters, especially, of course, in the upper end of the marketplace to some home buying. Uh, so the degree to which that becomes 
a bigger factor maybe in 2013 and 14 is something that we in the apartment market cannot underestimate. But at a macro level, the preference toward renting, uh, whether uh, it's uh, lifestyle related, whether it's um, psychologically uh, driven by what we're happening, what's happening with the economic conditions, uh, the hardship of uh, qualifying for a home loan, and the expectation that in many, many metros, uh, home prices haven't quite bottomed yet. A um, combination of all those things are still driving uh, people to the rental market versus the for sale housing market. We cannot expect that to last forever, however. I want to really emphasize that point. The result of all these factors coming together as compared to the uh, past uh, 12 years or so is shown on this graph. You can see the job growth patterns versus net absorption of apartments, which has been at record levels, remains very, very strong. In the first quarter of 2012, uh, we absorbed 36,000 units, uh, which is off a little bit from the uh, more recent quarters you see on the red line here on this graph, but still, if you compare it to the historical chart, at a very, very uh, strong level. And that caused a 30% drop, I mean, sorry, 30 basis point drop in the, in the vacancy rate. Um, so as the market continues to get tight and we see the, um, um, the drivers of absorption uh, continue into 2012, um, I think there's going to be a tug of war between how much uh, additional units we can absorb at this pace. I think the pace is probably going to slow down, but that's going to be more of a function of uh, lowered vacancy. Um, we have the results of our first poll, and at this time, if we can show those results, it would be uh, great to see how the audience feels about the, the job outlook. Those will be coming out here in just a couple of seconds. Um, uh, Six percent of the audience thought it was uh, weaker. Uh, actually, it's interesting to see how little uh, that is in, in comparison to the 50 percent that believe it'll be about the same and 42% uh, that believe it'll be stronger. Uh, so you are even more bullish than we are. We believe that it was maybe slightly better than, uh, than uh, the last 12 months when we issued our next 12-month forecast. But this is interesting to see the, uh, the optimism regarding job growth in the, in the marketplace. Uh, the, uh, the graph that you now see on the screen uh, shows the result of all this in the recovery of vacancies. Uh, what we've shown here is a Class A vacancy rate, which began to drop quicker as rents fell and the absorption of um, Class A units uh, led the recovery. Uh, but as importantly, the Class B and C uh, quality properties have joined this recovery. It's very important to recognize the broadening of the recovery outside of just the Class A segment. It's not a surprise that the Class A segment led, of course, given the concessions and, and rent declines that were happening in 2009 and 2010 uh, when, when the, new, the final phases of a lot of new product was delivered. Um, but now it is a much broader recovery, pushing vacancies uh, you know, to the 4.7%, 4.5% range this year. Uh, and uh, as of first quarter, we sit at 4.9%, so below 5% vacancy rate on a national basis. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about construction. Construction is a major concern, of course, as it should be. Uh, we have a forecast of uh, completions this year going from 40,000 units, as you can see on the graph, to about 80,000 market rate units. And that's probably going to enhance even further next year to about 120 to 150,000 units. Uh, it's a major increase, but if you look at historically, uh, it is well in line with, with historical average, actually below historical averages. And we do not believe that new construction is going to be a threat to the recovery cycle at the macro level in the foreseeable future. However, at, at the specific metro level, it will certainly become a factor, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, it also should be noted that a lot of our developer uh, clients that we interact with around the country are basically telling us that uh, from what they're monitoring, a lot of the units that um, are in various fa uh, phases of planning may not actually happen in 2012 or in 2013. So it, it is showing to be a harder prospect to bring units online than, uh, than perhaps um, uh, people thought uh, going, into the, uh, going into the year in 2012. So one of the most frequently asked um, requests that we have is for metro level updates on what's happening with vacancies and, and rents and so on. And uh, we have the latest 
ranking of apartment markets based on the first quarter 2012 numbers. On the left of this slide, you see the lowest vacancy markets with the change in vacancy over the past 12 months. On the right, you see the markets with the highest vacancy around the country and, and their respective changes. Some of the patterns to, to note here, of course, um, are of no surprise. Markets like New York, uh, San Jose, uh, San Francisco, Orange County, Boston, supply-constrained coastal markets uh, that have already recovered from their vacancy rise from the, from the recession and have uh, remained among the top markets in terms of low vacancies. But you have other markets like a Milwaukee or a Cleveland that uh, are also on this list, uh, Minneapolis certainly, mainly because of lack of new construction. In some cases, maybe a little bit better job growth than, than expected. And uh, note that their degree, the degree of, of uh, 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 recovery or reduction in vacancy in some of the low vacancy markets, of course, is going to be very limited now that they're already pretty tight uh, or below long-term averages or at long-term averages. However, if you look at the right side, uh, there is a lot more interesting movement that should be noted in that markets uh, such as the Texas markets, such as Phoenix, such as Las Vegas, are finally showing significant drops in vacancy on a year-over-year -year basis, uh, 200 basis points uh, and higher in some cases, and many of them in the 150 basis point or, or higher range. So the hard-hit markets uh, of the recession are now showing pretty, pretty good recovery. Uh, Texas in particular comes to mind where you have the major markets, Dallas and, uh, and Houston, now joining the ranks of, of markets that are recovering extremely fast, given what's happened with their economies, given the unique dynamic of very little new construction in 2012 and, and possibly 13. But beyond that, of course, uh, the pipeline of new product becomes a concern in places that tend to overbuild uh, as well. Uh, at this point, I'd like to go to our next polling question, and uh, that has to do with your expectations of uh, uh, apartment rents. So the question will be, over the next 12 months, do you expect rent growth to stall, rise in the 2 to 3 percent range, rise in the 4 to 6 percent range, or rise even more? And we'll be eager to see what your expectations are regarding the rental market. Uh, at this point, uh, we're going to start the discussion uh, of the capital markets and what's happening there. But before I uh, ask Bill to uh, start his presentation, Bill, any comments or reactions to the economic discussion so far? Well, Sam, you know, this is a very interesting year and uh, unusual year for us. It only happens every, every four years. It's an election year. We're entering into an election year. We're entering into what would be the, lumber, the uh, summer lull. Uh, things tend to slow down. We have clearly an economy that's a moderate growth economy. You know, what happens over the next few months? What happens during this summer? Where does the economy go? And more importantly, how might that uh, impact the fundamentals, which we've all seen as pretty positive over the last uh, clearly year in the multifamily sector? How, how do you see that working out? Well, we have some major issues. Uh, there is the election, of course, and the political logjam uh, that does create uncertainty. Companies tend to be hesitant. If you look at a chart, for example, that we frequently use showing corporate profits that have continued to go up, but corporate investment has actually tapered off over the past uh, several quarters. So it, although companies are doing well, they're not uh, – uh, necessarily in a high confidence mode and therefore willing to take risk, willing to expand, willing to hire large numbers of people. Uh, but as I mentioned, given the productivity growth, given what's happened with temporary work versus long-term workers and so on, I think companies have no choice but to add workers to keep up with demand, but it's going to stay at a very moderate level. Uh, we would normally have a much more naturally driven organic recover, recovery uh, pace happening right now if it weren't for all these headwinds. So the natural pace of the organic recovery is, is saddled by all these concerns, the uncertainty and the uh, fear factor that I think is going to be with us probably at least through 2012. And of course, depending on the election outcome, maybe we get a little more clarity, maybe we won't. Uh, but um, that, you know, the, the, debt, the debt downgrade in particular, the threat of another downgrade, what happens with Europe, these are serious concerns that keep uh, companies you know, pretty cautious. Certainly are. Bill, before you actually start, we have the poll results uh, from the last question 
that I asked regarding the uh, apartment fundamentals. And uh, are those uh, being shown? Great. The results uh, have come up. And uh, wow, the vast majority of participants uh, expect rent growth in the 2 to 3% range, which is actually below the range of our expectation. Uh, rent growth, effective rent growth last year was about 4% on a nationwide basis, and we expect that to increase to about 4.5%, uh, maybe even 5%. So there is more caution among our clients on the call regarding rent growth. And we'll talk about that in, in, a, in a few minutes after the capital markets discussion. Bill? Well, I want to say uh, certainly welcome to everyone uh, today uh, for joining us. I'm going to try to give you a quick uh, overview of what we've been through over the last few months. Once we uh, do that, we'll talk a little bit about interest rates, uh, really the stability of interest rates that we've all enjoyed over the last six months. Uh, outlook for maybe a little bit more volatility as we move into the next uh, six months to clearly a year. And then we'll, we'll take a look at the future. Where do we think things are going? What's happening in the marketplace? I don't think with the review there's really anything that's too surprising there. The reality of the review is that uh, this marketplace uh, is really driven by historically low interest rates. We've enjoyed historically low interest rates now for the last year. It's driven certainly cash flow. It's certainly driven value. It's been very positive to us. Lenders' attitudes have been formulated over the fact that uh, property fundamentals have done so well. We've seen vacancies fall. We've seen rental growth. And this has not only moved from the Class A product but back down now into the B quality product and C quality product so that ultimately there is debt uh, capital available for any multifamily property uh, generally across the country. Underwriting is still pretty conservative, but we've seen particularly at the local level with local banks uh, become a little bit more aggressive with uh, moving from a 125 debt service coverage as far down as to 115. Uh, producing loan-to-values as high as 80%. So loan-to-values today, depending upon where you go, if you're doing a deal with a life insurance company and want a very aggressive rate, you might be at 60%, 65%. But clearly, more highly leveraged transactions are out there. Capital Stack, as we all know, is served by certainly the agents whose agencies, life insurance companies, local and regional banks. We've seen national banks, multinational banks come to the uh, forefront now participate in, in the business. And certainly, debt funds have led the way in terms of providing more highly leveraged uh, debt and structured debt into the uh, multifamily arena. I wanted to take a look with this slide over what's really happened from what we'll call the, uh, the high flying days um, of uh, 2006 to 2007 really when we sort of shut down the credit markets imploded on us from 2009 to 2010 and then ultimately today. And uh, I find it kind of interesting, particularly if you take a look back to the 2006 to 2007 period compared to today, in terms of the actual structure uh, of debt available, not a whole lot of difference. 80% um, debt, pretty available uh, there. We've moved to 55% uh, uh, when the capital markets sort of shut down. We're at 75% debt today. And really, we could do an 80% debt uh, uh, transaction day, straight debt transactions. In terms of structured debt, structured debt I'm going to define as both MES and preferred equity. Um, really, uh, in the heyday, we got up to clearly 95% in structuring. Um, even up higher in some instances, as, as little as 2% equity doing some of those transactions. And then obviously we shut down in 2009, 2010, 20% equity required. Um, with a 55% debt load, we could structure another 25% on, a, on a structured debt, so you could start to get up there. But the real picture is today, look, we're, we're financing transactions with a lot of liquidity in the marketplace. Uh, the ability to finance up the capital stack uh, clearly to 90% today. And I think if you look at the graphs and compare the bar charts, the real story here is the cost of the debt. Our debt financing today, generally speaking, is somewhere between 
you know, three and three quarters to maybe four and a half. Returns on structured debt have fallen off. It's gotten much more competitive in that arena. Uh, and we're clearly in the 10 to 12 percent range. So that is a pretty healthy market in my mind. I wanted to look a little bit at the interest rates. I wanted to look at, obviously, and we do this often, we compare the difference between core inflation, which which really tends to correlate quite well, closely with a 10-year treasury. And as inflation impacts bonds value, obviously, it drives yields. Um, and here you can see that on a 40-year average, both core inflation and the 10-year are considerably below their 40-year average. But uh, core inflation has now moved, actually exceeded its 10-year average. Um, and while the 10-year is still considerably lower than its 10-year average, I think the point here is where those two lines cross, particularly with the Treasury being low, that's really driven by fear in the marketplace. Um, the sort of erratic nature of our global economy, while it is improving, it's moderate. Uh, we have starts and finishes, uh, it ebbs and flows. The global economy, what's going on with Europe, as Sassam pointed out earlier, issues relative to recession in Europe, uh, slowing uh, growth in China. All those things tend to push global investors to the safe haven of U.S. Treasuries and has kept the U.S. Treasury down, uh, as well as certainly our government is subsidized as well. So we tend to think that those rates will stay down for a period of time, and we'll give you about forecast of where we think they're going to go. I only show this graph because I want to compare where we were last year to this year. Uh, clearly, we're in better shape today. We're still at historical lows. This also sort of speaks to the stability of what we've seen over the last quarter in terms of interest rates. So um, great time to borrow money, and I'm not suggesting this is where you want to do it, but for long-term fixed-rate financing, it's a great time to jump into the marketplace. I did want to, however, talk a little bit about the possibility of a little bit more volatility entering the market. Uh, as you recall, earlier in the year, we started to get some good news about um, our employment numbers. They were pretty steady. They were growing. They were pretty consistent. I think consumers started to feel more comfortable with what was going on in the economy. Our indices were improving. Manufacturing was getting better. There was a period of time, about 30 days, we didn't hear much about Europe and didn't hear about what was going on. Uh, Germany had uh, taken some steps to really fortify uh, debt in a number of uh, countries there. Uh, we thought it was pretty positive stuff. And the reality is we saw rates starting to climb and climb pretty dramatically. Um, then all of a sudden, you know, we saw some new employment numbers. They weren't quite as positive. And so we've got built into the system clearly the ability to have some rates moving around. And that's the fear we have. At some point in time, uh, this climb in the 10-year, this climb in rates will take hold as our employment numbers become more consistent. They grow um, and uh, Europe sort of works through its it's challenged issues, we, we, will, we will get there. So I wanted to take a look at really acquisition financing for apartments. Uh, the interesting thing, obviously, if you look at the far left-hand graph, uh, hopefully it comes up green on your monitor. It's green on my monitor. Uh, CMBS sort of gone in the next bar charts. Uh, CMBS, uh, it, we, we did a bunch of business. They left. Obviously, you saw, luckily, we had the agencies. They took majority of the, uh, the market share, certainly gained market share, uh, 2009, 2010. Uh, 2011 sort of started to fall back to what their norms and stabilized about the mid-60s. That's where we see them. In later years, now we're starting to see certainly uh, national banks, multinational banks, local and regional banks uh, start to take gain ground. Life insurance companies certainly this last year have taken a certain market share. So we're getting to have a more, more capital sources active in the marketplace, and I think that's really good uh, for the, certainly the, the, um, the market. Um, I, I would, I've got to talk about maturities. Everyone talks about maturities. I really don't think it's a real big deal, particularly for apartments. 
And the reason I say that is with property fundamentals being as strong as they are, it's allowed servicers to manage their way through uh, some of the maturities and some of the delinquencies. Um, most of the major maturity issues and delinquency issues are with other property types, not so much apartments, although there clearly are some apartments out there. Um, uh, we, we just had uh, in the last quarter, uh, there was a lot of concern over those five-year loans that were done in 2007 maturing now. A lot of that product was coming due. Three-quarters of that product was going to come due. About uh, $19 billion was going to come due in the first half this year. We've gone through $9 billion. It's really sorted itself out. Um, uh, about half of that has paid off. Only about 20% of that had any loss. Uh, about 25% is currently um, going through foreclosure, and, um, and there will be a few more deals. But certainly, we're not seeing the blood in the water, uh, and we, we typically won't for certainly multifamily. I also need to mention CMBS, even though it has basically been non-existent, particularly in the multifamily arena, um, because there was a time when it played a significant role and had gained significant ground. It is coming back. While well, last year was a disappointment for everyone, we closed right around $32 billion. This first quarter is a hangover of last year. Uh, it's also a bit of a disappointment, $6 billion. We expect that market this year to be about a $40 to $50 billion market. We think by mid-year we should be at $20 billion. We'd like to see that accelerate through the year. We will see some of that product uh, become available and push in the multifamily arena, um, although I'm not so sure uh, too aggressively this year. But it does help because as as these sources, as this money flows into other products, there's more money certainly available for the multifamily arena. Um, last, really, relative to interest rates, so these are the Fannie Mae Tier 2 rates. Obviously, it shows the 10-year, it shows where rates are. Uh, we're in really great shape. Historically low rates, historically low 10-year treasuries. The agencies have done a great job. 10-year uh, debt, you should be able to get a 10-year deal for uh, four-ish, uh, a little bit under four, actually, for real good quality product. And even for smaller product, you might be uh, 30 basis points above that. So it's a, a great time to borrow, very consistent in the marketplace. And uh, Fannie and Freddie are both enjoying uh, great years so far. So I wanted to take a look at really just to wind up, you know, where are we going to go here in the next uh, six months or so? And the reality is, uh, you know, we expect debt and equity markets to remain stable and accommodating. Uh, challenges include, obviously, the domestic uh, choppiness in the economy, employment numbers, if they slow, inconsistency in indices. Uh, the election is always an issue that Hassan pointed to. It may not mean anything, but it do, you do have to question what happens there. Global influences, clearly, we have more global influences today than we've ever had before. And clearly what goes on in Europe, what happens to China, what happens to the economies of Europe do impact our economy. Uh, we are no longer a sheltered domestic economy. Uh, capital stack will remain healthy. I, I'm not going to say may remain healthy. It will remain healthy and open throughout the sector of apartments. Uh, we've got agency lenders active, trying to gain more ground, actually. Life insurance companies, more allocation. They're trying to gain ground. Regional local banks, and now that the national banks are back in play, uh, it's, it bodes for a very healthy market. Plenty of debt funds to finance along the capital stack at higher uh, leverage levels. And CMBS uh, making a reemergence, although, once again, I don't think it's going to play real well into what we do. So investor strategies, uh, maturing over leveraged properties. There shouldn't be a few, uh, many out there, but obviously there is money to recapitalize partnerships. Uh, we do have plenty of MES funds and preferred equity funds. Fairly low cost today, which is the other benefit, 10, 12, 13% returns on those. Uh, that's about as low as it's been in, in certainly the last, I want to say, five years. 
Uh, so it's all good. Gives you an opportunity to recapitalize, not to mention that with our ability to finance at levels of 80 percent, we should have very few transactions that we're having problems getting done in the multifamily arena. So let's take a look at uh, refinance. You know, if you're a small investor, where do you go? One to $10 million. Obviously, you have Fannie Mae's small product. There's a lot of local and regional banks in the marketplace financing terms, three, seven, five, ten years. Very aggressive financing today. Three-year financing, probably 335 to 350-ish. Five-year financing, 350-ish to four. Uh, Seven-year financing, maybe 420-ish to four and a half. Ten-year financing, 44 uh, to maybe 47. Uh, and then if your uh, 10-year, 10 million to 20 million or longer, those groups are pretty much the same. Plenty of capital along the entire capital stack. You've got a transaction that you need to overlever a little bit, certainly preferred. Uh, and mezzanine financing is available to you at, at costs that I think are certainly reasonable today. A lot of options in the arena. Financing in those arenas, certainly five, seven, and 10 years, five years at three and a quarter ish, uh, seven year at three and three quarter ish, and certainly uh, 10 years, something below uh, 4%. I don't think it gets any better than that, Hassam. And, you know, I think there's a lot of availability of capital. Lenders are looking to do deals. Uh, it's a pretty strong market from a financing standpoint. Great, Bill. Thanks. Uh, a couple of uh, uh, notes. One is that we're going to launch our next audience question, uh, and that has to do with your expectation of interest rates. And uh, over the next uh, 18 to, to uh, 24 months, do you believe or expect interest rates to go down? I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's a realistic expectation, but let's see what the audience feels given the uh, – the volatility in the marketplace would be interesting to see how everyone feels about that. Stay the same, go up moderately or go up significantly. Uh, I think that's an important uh, underlying point of discussion regarding the investment side, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, we've also received a lot of great audience questions. For those of you that have submitted them, thank you. Or at the end of our uh, formal presentation, we're going to address a number of those questions. And if you haven't submitted one, I encourage you to do so. We will respond to all the questions that we don't get to on today's session uh, individually. Uh, Bill, one of the questions that's, that's come up uh, from several uh, participants is your outlook for Fannie and Freddie. Obviously, we now have many different sources of financing as opposed to the heat of the crisis back in 2009 where the agencies were pretty much uh, you know, the dominant, if, if not uh, for, for a period anyway, the only lender uh, for apartments. But now we have multiple choice, uh, sort of a lending environment. How do you expect the agency uh, sort of uh, outcome to pan out, especially given the elections and given what's happening in Washington? Well, I, I think, first of all, the elections extend that period of time uh, where we just don't know. Uh, I, don't think, uh, I don't think the current uh, um, uh, administration is going to take any steps one way or the other. I think we're still... Uh, probably a year and a half to two years out before we have any clear direction, number one. Number two, if the government's going to stay in the housing sector and subsidize housing, what a better way to subsidize housing than in the multifamily arena? And clearly, I think they understand that. I think that uh, the multifamily arena has proven that they can use money effectively. Both Freddie and Fannie in the multifamily sectors are profitable. Yeah, they haven't lost money. They're the groups that are really kind of helping to carry the single family uh, part of the business. I, I've got to believe that Congress sees the benefit in that and will figure out how to make those agencies go together. Now, I can't tell you what it looks like. I, I don't know if it's one agency or two agencies. I don't know if they're supported publicly or if they become private. Uh, um, I, I can't believe that. But if it does go private, what everyone has to understand is that there's additional cost to it. So you lose some benefit in, in pricing. I, I would put money on the fact that they'll be there. Uh, I'm not sure I could tell you what color they're going to be. Great. Thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the uh, results of the last question, I believe, are, are in. And if we can show that. It looks like the uh, vast majority 
expect interest rates to go up moderately. 67% of our audience members believe that interest rates will go up moderately, and 27% uh, believe it will go up, uh, or I'm sorry, it will stay about the same. Uh, little, if anyone, uh, thought it would, it would uh, go down. Uh, so, interesting results, uh, very consistent well, with Well, uh, you know, I think that, and you and I talk about this a lot, you know, we both sort of agree that we think they're going to go up moderately. There's pressure. I'm not sure it's going to happen in the next six months, but, you know, we're saying that the 10 years should be 225 to 250 ish. It's kind of over the next year. Um, and I think that's uh, probably a pretty realistic number. And I would say that's moderate in terms of, of the economy and everything else that's going on. Sure. Right. At this point, uh, I'd like to uh, move forward with uh, an, an outlook on our investment uh, trends. And I'll start out by uh, showing what's been happening in the transaction markets in terms of dollar volume of sales. As you can see, 2011 uh, was a very strong year. We saw some rebound off the extreme lows in 2009. Uh, and uh, that improvement uh, continued into 2011 with just short of $64 billion of apartments uh, changing hands. The first quarter of 2012 uh, registered about $17 billion of sales versus about $10 billion of sale, sales in the same period uh, last year. So there is a steady rise in sales activity. Uh, obviously, when you have a combination of improving fundamentals, improving uh, sentiment, as well as extremely low interest rates, more lenders, being willing to lend, uh, it's not surprising to see this activity uh, show up on the numbers. However, um, it's, it's a very skewed kind of a, uh, an environment when you look at overall statistics. For example, if you look at average prices for apartments uh, based on trades that have occurred every year, uh, we see a steady increase and really almost a recovery back to 2006, 2007 pricing levels on a per unit basis with the cap rate indicator basically pushing back down. Uh, not quite as low as it's been in the past, but a, uh, a significant recompression of cap rates from the peak of the downturn in 2009. And on the surface, this appears to be a very important industry-wide indicator. However, when we really peel back uh, the capital flows and the effect they've had on the marketplace, it becomes evident very quickly that the dominant uh, migration of capital has been in the 20 million plus uh, high quality assets in the preferred markets that have greatly skewed these averages. If you look at the price per uh, unit paid on the 20 million plus category versus the mid market, the 10 to 20 uh, category, which is really a, a mix of private investors, hybrid investors, and some institutions. Uh, and then go down to the $1 to $10 million market, which is dominated by smaller private investors, you can see that uh, uh, the movement back to peak pricing and even for, uh, for a brief period above peak pricing in 2007 has been limited to the $20 million plus institutional quality assets uh, with the uh, recovery in, in price in the other price tranches being very, very moderate and not really even happening until later in this in these uh, time series that are shown in the graph. If you look at uh, the cap rate trends, we have dissected cap rates uh, for Class A product across the country, for Class B, C product across the country, and uh, overall cap rates, this is really Class A cap rates in the preferred markets. Uh, it becomes very clear as to where the capital migration has been. The preferred markets, of course, have uh, have dominated this uh, and in, early in the recovery, that was a very unique window of acquisition opportunities uh, during the crisis where the market had come to a virtual standstill, and there was a unique opportunity to acquire product uh, during, that, during that time of market dislocation. That has, of course, that window has closed very, very rapidly. And we can see that uh, over the past a few quarters, uh, the cap rates in the preferred markets have really begun to flatten out especially the capital market disruption late last year that created a bit of a pause in the marketplace uh, is, uh, is noteworthy. And the fact that uh, for that very high-end, low cap rate product, the spread to the interest rate, which has been a major driver, as well as replacement cost, which has been a major driver, um, are not quite as strong of an indicator as they once were in 2010, maybe even the first part of 2011. At the same time, this migration of capital 
uh, to lower quality properties, the B and C uh, sectors, maybe to some secondary markets, is just beginning to form. Uh, as there is more confidence in the job recovery, as there is more confidence in the class B and C absorption recovery, which, as I mentioned earlier in their presentation, lagged, we see some of that movement. In fact, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, analysis of cap rates by the type of market, primary versus secondary versus tertiary, you can see that the secondary market cap rates are beginning to show this migration of capital very slowly. It's not a sharp descent um, where tertiary markets are still lagging. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that may be holding that back, in addition to investor caution and uh, risk aversion, is, uh, is the lender uh, community. Uh, there's still a fair amount of concern regarding tertiary markets and where the drivers are going to come from in, in those markets. Uh, but at this time, what I'd like to do is uh, go to our final audience uh, poll, and that is uh, to get an idea of your expectations uh, over the next 12 months regarding uh, what's happening with Class A, but uh, Class A cap rates, but really fundamentally uh, asking you whether you believe that Class A cap rates are, fr are basically frothy or justified. And uh, that will give us a basis of some discussion as to what we think we uh, might see unfold over the next uh, uh, 12 to 18 months. So uh, an important component of this Class A capital migration and what's happened with the institutional market versus the hybrid investment market in apartments versus the smaller private investment market is the power of, of the publicly traded REITs. Uh, they've had an outstanding recovery uh, since the bottom. Uh, REITs in general were overly punished during the, uh, the crisis uh, because there was a big unknown regarding commercial real estate. That quickly uh, resolved itself once it was proven that uh, commercial real estate was really not falling off a cliff. And, of course, apartments being uh, the leading recovery sector have caught a lot of attention from, from capital sources all over the world. Uh, so you can see on this graph the results of all this with apartment REITs having moved 278% from the bottom uh, versus 185% movement for all REITs and 99% uh, for the S&P 500 in general. So publicly traded REITs uh, have a, a dominant uh, uh, force in the marketplace just in terms of their uh, cost of capital and their cutting-edge management and ability to uh, fine-tune operations very, very quickly. And uh, this is an important uh, factor and it's an important indication of how the broader capital markets are viewing uh, the apartment sector. The um, graph that you see on your screen is one that I use frequently, and it has to do with a lot of questions I, I get around the country as to why apartments. Uh, of course, the fundamentals, the demographics, the lack of new supply in relation to the, to the uh, amazing levels of demand we're seeing, the, uh, the unfolding rent growth, uh, uh, are huge drivers. But if you look at one of the uh, important comparisons of alternative investments, uh, it's really the spread between cap rates and interest rates. And historically, looking at times when the gap was wide, uh, those times uh, turn out to be extremely attractive times to, to buy apartments. Examples are 1992, 1998, 2002, and of course 2009 when the gap widened. And today, largely thanks to a very, very low interest rates for a variety of reasons that, that uh, Bill's talked about, uh, the gap is, is still significant. For the Class A sector, as we have challenges with wage growth, as we have some home buying, as we have some new construction coming into the marketplace, the challenges kind of mount in that a lot of the justification for the cap rates and the tightening band of cap rate, uh, Class A cap rates versus interest rates are challenged now by some of these factors. Can we really get the rent growth that's necessary given the cap rates? Um, and I get the question quite a bit as to whether uh, that's going to be uh, sustainable. Uh, and if you, if you look at what's happened with alternative investments and what's happened in a low-yield environment and the prospects of so much of the acquisition of Class A top-tier product in primary markets being very, very hard to replace um, properties in supply-constrained markets, that is an important factor to keep in mind. But there are headwinds and challenges uh, that are unfolding as we speak for that upper end of the marketplace. Um, and so at this point, let's take a look at uh, how you all feel about the frothiness of the Class A uh, marketplace. And the results will be shown here in just a moment. 
before we uh, go into uh, audience questions. Uh, and 70% of you believe that today's Class A uh, pricing is, uh, is frothy. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, as I get into this discussion with a lot of investors around the country, Bill, uh, it, there's a profound difference between that question today versus the acquisitions that were made even a year ago or six months ago where there wasn't as much compression as there is today in the marketplace. And so there is clearly concern in the marketplace about rate, uh, rank growth and how much wage growth can, can really keep up with rank growth and, and how we could translate all that into uh, the investment dynamics. It'll be interesting to see what happens in the next year with that. That's, that's, that's going to be a big question in everyone's minds. Right. So at this point, what I'd like to do is um, uh, start our question and answer uh, session. I really appreciate all the questions you've sent. We've received many of them. The, the board here has been uh, lighting up with a lot of questions coming in. And, Bill, I'm going to start with uh, another question that's come up with uh, 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 the audience regarding the capital markets and interest rates uh, and availability of debt. Uh, to what degree do you think there will be more and more lenders willing to uh, get into either construction lending, uh, and is construction lending a factor holding back new construction? Or do you see that uh, construction lending is going to be widely available? Well, we've, we've certainly seen a change in the marketplace over the last six months. You know, if you were talking about construction lending six months ago, certainly a year ago, you, it would have fallen on deaf ears. Um, we are seeing now construction lenders, many construction lenders in the marketplace now, for multifamily. It's not in every sector of commercial real estate, but in the multifamily sector, because the property fundamentals have done so well and based upon market-to-market, fundamentals, there are construction lenders, and uh, the, the, the structures of those construction loans are pretty uh, aggressive, really. So, you know, some of the big banks are uh, certainly in the business, um, uh, and they've been in the business, and we've structured a number of construction loans for clients around the country. If you're in a tertiary smart market and you've got a maybe a B-quality deal you're trying to come to the market with, probably going to have some challenges there. But in major markets, primary markets, there is a plethora of construction lenders willing and ready to do your deal um, if you're a strong borrower, if you have experience, know what you're doing, if you've got a product that uh, is supported by market data um, with, um, um, uh, with good with what just otherwise good support, sure. you can get those deals done, and we expect that to actually increase. That availability of debt, just like permanent debt is increased, um, as long as there's not a reversal of fortune in the multifamily arena, which we don't think there will be, we think that there will be that. Th there is a question now, Hassam, as you well recognize, you know, what happens when we start adding these units? What happens with the shadow residential that is in the marketplace? Um, so lenders are pretty smart. They're asking the questions, and that's why it is really market-to-market -market and very specific. And the availability of construction finance uh, is going to be that way, I, I think, for some time. For some time. Great. But, you know, I, I'm going to turn the tail on you a little sure, bit and ask sure. you a question. You know, I, we know interest rates. We, I showed a slide a few minutes ago about the volatility of interest rates. They could jump up and jump down. Obviously, cap rates, for, particularly for Class A property and big markets, uh, have been relatively uh, low for some time now. You started, you discussed the, the issue relative to risks there. But clearly, there's that big gap between treasuries and, um, and cap rates. Mm -hmm. You know, at what point in time, if, if we agree that over the next 12 months, we could see a treasury increase, and let's say it's at the upper end of what we think it might be, 250-ish, so it's going to increase 50 basis points. Is there enough room for it all to be absorbed? Is there a one-to-one -one relationship between the increase in treasury now, particularly for A quality, and I think it might vary property to property, but... Is there a relationship between that increase and what will happen to cap rates, do you think? Well, I think it has to do with the drivers of that increase in, in interest rate. If we're seeing more job growth, that should translate to more demand for units and therefore strong rent growth. And to the degree that operations are keeping up, uh, or NOI growth is keeping up, or hitting expectations, 
um, I, I think there's going to be some offset. I also think whether it's spreads, whether it's the fact that the apartment product in general is very sought after in a very low yield environment for long-term investing, I don't expect a one-for-one -one correlation between cap rate movement and interest rate movement for the next uh, 12 to, to 18 months. But long term, there is no question that a normalized economic environment, a normalized interest rate environment of the Treasury of around 4%, uh, which is a couple hundred basis points above where we are today, is a major factor when it comes to uh, cap rate um, exit strategies and, and expectations. Uh, and it all has to do with, their, with whether that rent growth component is going to be able to keep up. But um, we can't ignore uh, the institutional capital demand for certain type of assets and certain type of markets either. Uh, so uh, I think that's another factor that uh, from an exit uh, uh, standpoint, a lot of our clients, of course, around the country uh, take into account when looking at their investment strategy. Uh, Bill, a related question from the audience uh, to construction financing is the whole notion of if there is a perceived froth, if there's a froth in the Class A segment, and as I mentioned, there is more risk tolerance and there is more appetite for Class B and C, maybe value add, some higher risk, higher return types of capital migration for apartments, are the lenders going to be there to lend to a Class B, a B minus, a C, that may justify some, let's say, at least light value add? Um, or is that going to be a challenge to this capital migration that logically should happen? Well, I think, first of all, Hassam, there are today sources of capital for the value-add transaction. There's bridge financing. Banks are in the bridge financing business that will do value-add transactions. There are clearly debt funds that will do value-add transactions. There's a way to get those transactions done as value-add. In terms of new construction with maybe building an apartment with fewer amenities and, and uh, sourcing um, uh, renters that, that are maybe a little bit lower end renter, mm -hmm. uh, if it makes sense in a marketplace, I think the construction lenders are willing and able to do that. They just want to make sure that the market dynamics support the decision to move into a market to get a deal done. We all have to remember that banks need to do deals to stay alive. They, they, they can't sit on the sidelines and not do deals. And construction lending has always been a very profitable part of their business. Uh, part of that answer is also, and it's a complicated answer, but part of that answer relates to the healthiness of their portfolios. So it is the bigger banks that are more likely going to be more active in the construction finance business across the country, and once again, they're going to be in more of the major primary markets, and you're not going to see as a, a big a run into the tertiary markets where they might in the, in the uh, permanent end of the, the spec sector. Thanks, Bill. Uh, another frequent question from many of you has been uh, geared around the global uh, macroeconomic factors and to what degree uh, they affect growth here in the U.S., and um, I, I can say that uh, uh, based on the positive indicators and the headwinds that I shared with you at the beginning of the presentation, uh, it's clear to see that the U.S. economy is moving forward, albeit at a very moderate pace, albeit in, in a not very exciting fashion that doesn't really feel like a recovery. But certainly the, the numbers are getting better and better on a fundamentals basis. But we are affected by global capital markets. I'll be interested on, on your thoughts on that. Europe, for example, um, uh, captures 20% of our exports. And as I mentioned earlier, exports have been a bright spot in, in this uh, recovery. And 20% uh, of our exports go into Europe uh, that is in recession or teetering on recession is a major factor. Uh, that has a lot to do with uh, manufacturing, has a lot to do with uh, service exports. Um, but when China slows down uh, and when China has to slow down, uh, when there is turmoil that at a time of a, maybe a global slowdown uh, still keeps energy prices very, very high and, and saps discretionary spending. Uh, there is a direct correlation. And I think all these things, should they flare up, could threaten uh, our recovery. But without a flare-up and with this sort of ongoing uh, bit of an anchor around uh, our ankles, I think it's more of the same moderate growth. Any thoughts uh, you may well, want to add? Because a lot of people ask about it. I don't think you could answer that any better. I, I think clearly over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we've moved from a pretty isolated domestic 
a market economy to a global economy. What happens in Spain impacts us in some level in the United States. What happens in China as one of the largest economies in the world uh, impacts us in the U.S. We've never had to deal with that, and now we have to, and that's a new um, issue out there that is that, that is plays into one of the reasons that the Treasury has moved uh, in a direction that it would normally not move relative to core inflation is that the foreign investor fills risk. They're dumping a lot of money into the safe haven of the U.S. Treasury, and that's why you have that, that market, and, and that's relatively new. We're going to have to live with that. It's not going away. Right. No, that's a, that's a great add-on comment. Thank you, Bill. Uh, we, have, we still have over uh, 1,200 attendees on the, uh, on the session, so I'm going to take uh, just one more question from the audience, and, uh, and then we'll wrap up this, the, uh, this uh, particular session. Uh, Bill, the um, audience uh, submitted a lot of questions regarding underwriting terms. Given the number of lenders now back in the marketplace for apartments, two questions came up from a number of attendees. One is, at what point do you see tertiary markets, the true uh, outlying markets that today are being uh, somewhat uh, avoided by investors and lenders really become more acceptable, number one? And number two, to what degree, given the competition among lenders now available in the marketplace, do you see terms changing? I, th I think we are certainly seeing lenders move into tertiary markets. Um, maybe not the absolute smallest tertiary markets. Those lenders are generally served by local community banks. They understand the real estate, and that's the proper place for those uh, investments to go. You're not going to find the agencies jumping in with both feet to do those transactions typically, um, although it's not that they won't do them. You're going to have to have an awfully conservative deal to get them to uh, jump into that marketplace because it's, you, you need a substantial market and you want a market that is a frothy market if you're going to go in and do a deal in a marketplace. Um, it, it's easier for the lender to service. They know what's going on. They have multiple assets in a transaction. W the way one asset goes, typically the other asset goes. So to have one asset in a very small market uh, somewhere in a tertiary arena is a challenge for any lender, and that's why you have some of the problems that you have. In terms of underwriting, I don't think underwriting is going to get much more aggressive. I think what we, we see is more of a concept of I'd rather compete with rate than with dollars. E even the lenders that we've seen, um, particularly on the coast, that have moved to maybe a 115 debt service coverage, they're still pretty they're still pretty conservative under the covers, if you know what I mean. And by that, I mean that their expenses are loaded up pretty high. They're making sure they account for all the expenses so they really understand what the true NOI is. And if they can feel good about the true NOI, and if they can feel really good about the, uh, the assets, the bricks and sticks, they, they will use a 115 debt service coverage. But I think loan to value is always a misnomer because what is my loan to value is not your sure. loan to value sure. and is not their loan to value. Right. And um, so on that level, I, I think typically we're going to stay pretty much where we are. We're not going to see anybody uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater today. We're going to be pretty steady as we go. Uh, and, yes, there will be maybe a few more loan dollars, but uh, not significant. Right. Thank you, Bill. With that... I'd like to thank you for your time and participation on our program. Uh, we will be conducting these uh, later in the year, and we'll be updating you on the dates. Uh, please give us your feedback. It's very important for us to adjust these programs according to what you'd like to see covered. And uh, thanks again for your time and for joining us. Thank you.